please join me in welcoming Mark Peters to the Sun Valley Forum. Thank you. Morning. Morning. How y'all doing? We need to do another star pose, or? Um, it, help, it helped me. So um, a couple of, couple of remarks of, sort of from, from a personal perspective before I walk through uh, some remarks that I have related to technology. Uh, first thing is, as a technologist, I'm the eternal optimist. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that technology is the solution, but I think there is technologies that exist and that we can imagine existing over the course of the next few years to several decades that can help us address the profound challenges that are uh, addressing climate change. Um, second, second point I would make is my personal background is I'm a geologist and a geochemist uh, by training. Uh, don't do a lot of it anymore. Spend a lot more time managing a great laboratory. Uh, but uh, for those who follow the science of climate change, a lot of it's about stable isotopes of ice cores and other things that we can use to understand how the climate's varied over time, geologic time. And so, and that's my background, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. Yes, the climate has varied in pretty profound ways over geologic time, but man is having a profound impact since the Industrial Revolution to today. The rate of change is unprecedented, and sort of perhaps saying what Jeff said a little bit differently, the way I say it anyway, I think he made the same point, running an experiment we don't understand with our climate. So, so I approach it from that perspective. So when I think about energy technologies, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about that, and resilience and other things, uh, I think about it from that perspective. So let's, let's talk for a second. If we're serious about meeting Paris climate goals and getting to what I'll call deep decarbonization, you've got to figure out how to get low carbon electricity, but you've also got to figure out how to get low carbon transportation and low carbon manufacturing industrial sector. So the electricity sector, I'll, I'll talk in relative sense, is easy, relatively speaking. Transportation is probably somewhat difficult, but penetrating the manufacturing sector could be quite profoundly difficult. So how you think about the energy technologies working together in an integrated way, particularly when you think about decades out, is something that's on my mind, our lab's mind, and we're working with other labs on that. I do want to spend a little bit of time just taking the opportunity to talk to you all. I'm going to go quickly through these slides. Um, but I, I want to remind you that there, as Amy pointed out, we're one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. We're spread all over the United States. Um, we do everything from very fundamental science, the labs. Uh, some labs are focused strictly on, for example, high energy physics, research related to origin of the universe. Really big picture science, operate big accelerators for science. Other labs are much more applied. We're in that category. Idaho National Laboratory is an applied science and engineering laboratory. So I like to say that we're much closer to applications that you might see as, as we talk about impacting the energy system, for example, in the next years to, to decades. So there's a lot of expertise there. We tend to be, some people understand us, but we tend to be kind of these, uh, at some level, somewhat not transparent. People don't truly understand the capabilities that the labs have, I would say, in general. So we're working very hard as labs to try to to try to become more transparent. We have a long history. I won't dwell on this. Um, the, we, have off, we have a research campus in Idaho Falls, Idaho, which is uh, about two and a half hours pretty much east of here. Uh, many of our employees live in Idaho Falls, Pocatello, Blackfoot, Rexburg, in that general area of eastern Idaho. But we also operate 890 square miles in the desert as you head out of Idaho Falls on US 20 towards Arco you basically drive through our site. So it started its life as the Natural Reactor Testing Station. Amy mentioned we have a, a multi-purpose lab now, and I'll talk more about that. But we started as the National Reactor Testing Station back in the latest 40s, early 50s. So if you look at the reactors that are nuclear reactors that are operating US globally, you can trace their roots back to something that was tested, demonstrated, sometimes to failure in the desert uh, east of, uh, west of Idaho Falls. So that's our heritage. We've gone through, uh, some of this is alphabet soup, right? We're a creature of the federal government, so we always have to use acronyms. I'm going to try to avoid those. But we've went through different, different 
types of INEL, INEEL. The bottom line is we're Idaho National Laboratory. When, we, when INL was created in 2005, we became this multi-purpose lab. So yes, we focus on nuclear energy, but we also focus on other clean energy options and national security and whatnot. So that's allowed us to address a range of problems. That engineering expertise can be brought to bear on a wide range of problems. But also, the interesting thing is that 890 square miles lets us do things at scale, which is really unique for the laboratory system. Long history, I've talked a little bit about it. We actually started even during World War II as the Naval Proving Grounds. So uh, for those of you from, this, from Idaho, uh, they made battleship gun shells in Pocatello. They would ship them up, to, up, up north, and we were actually testing battleship guns during World War II on that site. That was the, that was the beginning. Uh, for those of you who know that area, we shot them from the Mesa. Let's, let me get this right. I think we shot them from the Mesas south of the site towards the site, and then we switched directions and shot them towards the Mesas. Um, the Navy still has, a, the nuclear Navy in particular, still has a strong mission on the site. The laboratory itself is research and development. You read a lot about cleanup mission at the site. That's not, I don't manage that. That's a separate, separate contract, but we have interfaces. But we maintain the site. Bus service, you're going to hear a lot more. You're going to be a, hear about a really cool partnership with IBM in the next talk that's related to our bus fleet that we operate for our employees. So that's kind of our history. I won't dwell on our our mission, vision, values, but to say that my priority is to be much more transparent about what's going on at the lab, and sometimes it's a bit of a mystery, right? And so trying to be much more transparent and talk about what we do at the lab and, and, you know, and, and what we do well. And, and you know, yes, we're cleaning up the past in terms of nuclear contamination, the contractor that's working on that. We need to talk about that with the public and make sure everybody understands. My priority is to protect the aquifer, protect the public. But we've got to develop research, do research to develop technology options for the future. A couple of remarks on clean, resilient energy systems. And this is one area, Amy mentioned some partnerships. Uh, one of the areas is working with Sun Valley Institute in this region on electric charging infrastructure. That's an important part of this. I've already mentioned about electrification of the transportation sector. I happen to be really really bullish on thinking about how do we electrify the transportation sector. The key, though, is you have to have a low carbon electricity source to charge your car, right? The Chinese can talk about going to electrification, but if it's all coal with no capture, what's the point? So it's really a systems question. But I, you know, the Obama administration uses all the above, the Trump administration uses all the above, perhaps they mean something slightly different, but it is really about thinking about what is the diversity of energy sources that we can bring to bear that will help us solve this, solve this challenge. A lot of renewables, no doubt, and we're making tremendous progress in the scientific community and industry in, in driving down solar cell costs, for example, driving wind costs down, it's incredible. But I would put to you that you've got to think about, we're also at this interesting place where you have this large, largest of natural gas, unbelievable. So we're in this weird transition right now, so how do you think about that? So we've been working with other labs on what does that integrated system look like, and so we're quite excited about that. I don't want to have the debate here, but I want to ask you to open your minds. So story for you. So during the Obama administration, I had the uh, honor of going to the White House, not to the Oval Office, didn't get, to, didn't get to sit with the President, but I got to sit with some of his closest advisors. Because the conversation they were having was, if we're serious about mitigating climate change, what is the role of nuclear energy, in particular advanced nuclear energy? So we had some great conversations. Those conversations continue, of course, with the new administration. The dynamic and dialogue around climate change is, is quite different. Uh, but this, is, this slide happens to be from some colleagues, Third Way. It's an NGO in the DC area. But there's an interesting dialogue going on right now about what is the role of advanced nuclear as a part of solving the climate change problem. So my only plea would be that as you think about that future energy system, keep your mind open. Understand the innovation that's coming in the nuclear space. But to Jeff's point, we also were talking with the White House about how do you accelerate that innovation, because this is an urgent challenge. So one of the promises is small and very small reactors. So right now, the existing fleet, for example, very, very large reactors. They're, they're, they're under tremendous economic pressure. Uh, but there's, we're working with a company, New Scale, and a utility consortium in the area 
to hopefully demonstrate their small modular technology. When I say small, I mean 50 megawatt modules, even down to 10, 5, 10 megawatt modules. You think about the future energy system, that could be something that's much more agile, easier to deploy when you think about distributed, distributed generation, for example. So interesting technologies. I, all I'd ask you is there's, there's a startup space that's playing here. It's really, really fascinating stuff. So we're a part of helping to enable that. What I want to talk more about is grid modernization. This is an area we've brought our engineering expertise to the table. This is, a part, this is another example of the partnership. It was mentioned about partnering with Sun Valley Institute again on looking at critical assets like the hospital in the area. Uh, Kiki mentioned about one power line and then they want to bring another one in and it's right next to it. So what's the right solution to, 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 the, grid, to the grid? And you can think about applying a lot of what we're doing broadly and the tools that we bring, real-time digital simulation, the ability to take things from the pilot scale in our facilities in town to the, to the grid scale at the, in the desert. And I'll talk a little bit more about microgrids in a second. But we're collaborating across the labs with industry to bring those tools to bear. And so I think there's lots of opportunities to do even more, do even more with that. Microgrids. This happens to be a picture of Cordova, Alaska. So we're actually collaborating, a couple labs, with the city of Cordova. The mayor of Cordova, Alaska, is an incredible sort of innovative forward thinker. And he's partnering with the labs to actually think about how does he ha establish a self-healing microgrid for Cordova. Cordova actually has a lot of hydropower, sounds familiar to those of us here in Idaho. So we're talking about, okay, how do you integrate hydro with storage with other renewables into a self-healing microgrid? You can imagine this kind of thing and coming in and taking what we're thinking about here in the Wood River Valley to even a grander scale. So microgrids are an important part of the future, I think, as you think about a resilient, clean energy system. Haven't talked a lot about cyber yet. It was in Amy's introductory slides. So one of the other important things that we're contributing is thinking about the cyber threat. And I would put to you, yes, climate change is an existential threat, but I would suggest that cyber, cyber attack to our infrastructure is, is, well, you saw it in the rankings, it's climbing. So we bring an interesting nexus because of our capabilities. We have the ability to test wireless systems with the grid, and we have a lot of, we actually hire, I like to say hackers with a conscience, <laughs> right? So we bring these guys, we bring these men and women in, and if you walk into their offices, it's like their basement, right? Post, super, <laughs> Superman, Justice League stuff everywhere, Avengers stuff everywhere. It's all dark, kind of dim lights. But they're actually, they understand how to attack systems, and they're the right people to figure out how to defend systems. So we're working with utilities to be able to understand what the risks are, and then figure out how to mitigate those risks. And so this is another space that I think there's opportunity for a lot more partnering. It is about partnerships. Uh, you're gonna hear, like I already said, a great example uh, coming up in the next talk about how we're working with industry. We need to do more of that. Working with university, universities like the Idaho universities, excuse me. Um, so th these are important and very, very important for us as a laboratory going forward. It's about people, so we're growing, the number of interns, postdocs, joint appointments at the lab, uh, tremendous growth. Partnerships are really, really important. We've got an interesting challenge. Our workforce is aging, so we have opportunities to actually transform our workforce and make it much, look much more inclusive, much more diverse to go forward, and that's a priority for us. These fires are getting me too. It's tough. Yep, glass of water. Yeah, so state-of-the-art capabilities. So in order to do that, you need people, I talked about that, capability, but you also need uh, great facilities to attract people. So this is an example, a very Idaho-specific example. We've been working with the State Board of Education, with the Idaho State Building Authority, and we broke ground on two new buildings in, in Idaho Falls that are going to allow us to um, actually build out our cyber capability as well as our computing capability. 
Thank you. So unique opportunity, we're bringing in the university, so Boise State, University of Idaho, and Idaho State University. And the state's actually going to is bonding the buildings, and we're, we're going to be, we're, gonna, we're effectively the tenants. So the conversation with the legislature, for those of you who live in Idaho, you know that the legislature tends to be a pretty conservative bunch, right? So they don't like to take on a lot of these kind of responsibilities. We were able to articulate with the assistance of the universities the value of these to the state and the research mission and to the state more broadly. But the beauty of these is it takes our computing capability across the whole state and our cybersecurity research and development capability to the next level. So if you came down through Idaho Falls, you'd see there's actually iron popping up. We're actually moving. These will be in place by 2019. Just as an example, but those are pictorials, but that's what those are going to look like. So when you're talking about hiring the next generation, you want to bring them in, show them really cool interaction space, the opportunity to do cool things. This is an example. So thinking about how to build out those capabilities go forward is, and continuing to build on that is really important for us. So it's about science, innovation, and partnerships. Um, I'm not here to tell you that we've got it all solved, but I will tell you that you've got a willing partner in INL to come down, work with us, figure out how to accelerate innovation. Our job is to develop options. I don't pick winners. I develop options, technology options, working with other labs, with universities, and with industry. And so with that, I think I'm going to stop, uh, maybe yield back a little bit of time. Thank you. And appreciate your attention today. Thank you. Thank you.